On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Greg Mitchell. He is the author, or I should say the latest, uh, is author of his uh, latest, uh, The Atomic Cover-Up. And, of course, he writes uh, daily at Pressing Issues, which you can find at gregmitchellwriter.blogspot.com. Greg, thanks so much for uh, taking the time today. Hi, Sam. I'm always happy to be here. So uh, it is the 69th anniversary of uh, the day that we dropped uh, the first of uh, two atomic bombs. Uh, that one was the first uh, uh, 69 years ago was on Hiroshima. I mean, th this is something that you've been writing about for for years. I mean, why is it uh, why is it so important for us to uh, recall this event? Uh, yeah, I've been writing about it for over 30 years, and I, you know, I went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, 30 years ago for several weeks, and I've written three books, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something I I return to every August. Uh, I've probably posted another dozen stories in the past day. Um, I've always thought it was in incredibly important for, for, for several reasons, including the fact that uh, it, it has influenced America's views towards a nuclear buildup on a nuclear arms race in, in decades past, and even today influences Americans' views towards the actual use of nuclear weapons, even though, of course, our leaders and media and people will say, oh, never again, and we must never use them, but in fact, we still, uh, you know, polls show, certainly uh, media reports show uh, that, uh, you know, majority of people in the U.S. still support the use of the bombs then. No U.S. president has ever uh, criticized it except for Eisenhower when he was out of office. Um, so there's a sense that, uh, you know, never again, but uh, still defending those two two choices, and uh, which is completely contradictory. Uh, and, and second, it's just it's sort of the moral choice of, uh, you know, bombing, deliberately bombing civilians. We've seen it on a, on a lesser scale, but still horrid scale, in, you know, in Gaza. Uh, certainly the Gaza example brings back every, uh, every thought of Hiroshima just in the sense of uh, deliberately targeting uh, areas where civilians will die. And in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, indeed, we dropped the bombs over the center of cities. Uh, it was not a military. You know, Truman, in his, his first words about the attack, said, we, you know, we've, we've dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, a military base. Uh, well, there was a military base in Hiroshima, but it, the bomb was deliberately dropped over the center of the city. And in fact, you know, we were outraged by the number of dead children in Gaza in the past couple of weeks. But, you know, in Hiroshima, on one day, we killed 20 to 30,000 uh, and have found it acceptable since then, you know, most people. So, you know, a little, little perspective there. 20, 20 to 30,000 children. How many people right. um, were, were, were killed in Hiroshima? And, and, and we should talk about the, the, the death tally from Hiroshima really rolled on for decades right. mm -hmm. and decades. Well, you know, well, that's, the, of course, the radiation effect and other effects. So um, they officially today place the toll at about 150,000. Uh, some people feel they, you know, they maybe add some people who uh, may not have been related, but still the minimum might be 130,000. Uh, and um, the reason so many of them were women and children, the vast majority, was because, you know, most of the men were off at war or were, were working in a, you know, factory miles away. Um, most of the people in the city were women and children. Um, and so they had a disproportionate amount of casualties uh, in there. And the same in Nagasaki. Nagasaki didn't even have a major military base. Uh, so uh, they were you know, very industrial. So, uh, you know, it brings into focus uh, as much as we want to put it behind us, and some people do put it behind us, um, the whole notion of deliberately targeting tens of thousands or more than 100,000 for extermination. And uh, I know there's extenuating circumstances. I know World War II was horrible. I know there are questions uh, on whether Japan was going to surrender very soon. I happen to be in the camp that believes that, um, and Truman <laughs> seemed to be in this camp, if you go by his diary, that Japan 
would have surrendered within days because of the Soviet invasion. You know, as he wrote in his diary, finny Japs when that occurs. And indeed, the Soviets, as scheduled, uh, declared war and marched against the Japanese on August 8th. Um, and so I, I'm in that camp that believes that the war would have ended in, uh, very, very shortly without the bomb. Um, I know there are others who disagree, but I think when you're talking about the death of so many, particularly civilians, I think the weight of evidence has to be on those who believe it was a good idea, especially since in this case it set a terrible example for, uh, you know, until today, really, about the usefulness of nuclear weapons, about the ways you can defend their use, uh, the way you can justify it, uh, building more of them, building better ones, uh, targeting uh you know, first strike targeting, um, you know, and that it sets an example. And it's certainly an example that has not been repudiated by the U.S. media or its leaders in, in great contrast to the rest of the world or, you know, most of the rest of the world. Well, let's I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 this may be um, uh, remedial for some, but 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 tell us what the rationale was. I mean, um, obviously, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki were not. Um, the the line it's very hard to draw the line directly from uh, uh, this will hinder their military capacity right I mean so mm-hmm. so tell us I mean just uh, uh, for, uh, for those who who may not uh, uh, know or uh, you know recall because I you know right. as a child. I remember, you know, uh, maybe around the age of of my daughter's age now, uh, nine years old, uh, you know, reading. uh, uh, I can't remember what book it was, but it was like Fat Boy. It was it was the story of the bombers. And it was it was all from the perspective of these guys who dropped the bomb to end the war. Now, that was, Mm -hmm. you know, we were only 30 years out at that time. Uh, right. and, and now, you know, 69, 70 years later, um, the, the, these, it just seems like it's almost absent from the curriculum. Uh, but like you, right. you, you say, the, the implications well, I, continue on, right. but, but, but talk about I, that. Well, I, I posted a video today, in fact, where John Stewart, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, dared to suggest that maybe it wasn't Truman's uh, great decision, and he got so much criticism that he then apologized. You can imagine John Stewart the next night going on and apologizing for daring to question Truman. So, I mean, that has been the American narrative. And, I mean, the history well, in a nutshell... Yeah, tell us what the, the, the narrative was at that time. I mean, what, what was the well, justification? The, okay, we built the, you know, we built the bomb to attack Germany or Japan. Germany surrendered, and so Japan was still still fighting. And we had been, air, you know, uh, firebombing Japanese cities um, and defeating them across the Pacific. And then now it was down to the last, the last leg. We had, you know, all that was left was an invasion of Japan. Uh, and but they had uh, almost their entire navy was was shot. Their air force was shot. Uh, you know, they were starved out. They were on their last legs economically and food supplies and so forth. Nevertheless. The American narrative is that they would have kept fighting until this invasion, which was scheduled to start the first leg in November or December, and then the second leg, and I, I think it was February or March. So the invasion was quite a ways off. And where the, where the narrative gets confusing is that people will say, ah, but, you know, my father was heading for the Pacific and would have been invading, or uh, we would have lost uh, tens of thousands of uh, casualties in, in the invasion as if the invasion was was fated to happen. And in fact, there is no way that the invasion would have happened because uh, Truman knew, and again, you go to the Truman diary and his records, he knew that uh, he had the option of using the bomb. He knew the Soviets were going to invade. Um, you know, the question was what, would, what might the surrender terms be? There was no way he was going to send those armies into an invasion when he had other options, which included uh, what he eventually did, which well, even though he had said they we would only accept unconditional surrender and the japanese were saying well we might surrender if you let us keep our emperor uh after we use the bombs suddenly the u.s negotiating principle changed and we made the surrender conditional and we accepted the emperor uh, as you know uh, so um the fact that there's no question there was a giant invasion plan they had to plan it uh, there's no doubt that if it had happened, 
there would have we would have lost tens of thousands of you know injured or killed uh, the Japanese would have lost more no one disputes that the question is is it how likely is it that that would have ever happened uh, given the fact we did have the bomb and that the Russians were invading and you know so there there are those of us who believe that uh, Truman at the minimum should have held off using the bombs for a week or a month or whatever there was no no absolute need to use them at that moment and we'll never know if he had put it off for a week or a month um, you know what might have happened but I'm you know I believe the weight of uh, evidence has to be on you know no matter what we did uh, Japan would have kept fighting we would have had this invasion and uh, and all that would have happened why was Hiroshima chosen uh, as the um, a, a, as the city to bomb uh, first, a, as opposed to Nagasaki, but in general? Uh, it was always number one on the target list. Um, it was uh, it had not been heavily bombed, and we wanted you know this goes into the exper you know the dropping the bomb as a big experiment. We wanted to get a clean result. <laughs> you can call it that, a clean result. We wanted to be able to judge how this bomb worked, and if we dropped it on a city that had already been firebombed, of course it would have killed a lot less people, but um, it, uh, yeah, it, would have been, it would have been hard to tell what it really did. So Hiroshima happened to be, unluckily, um, you know, and I've been there, and I've seen this. Uh, it's in a kind of a bowl. It's surrounded by hills, except on one side, and it was the city of 350,000. And you could, and we did, drop it over the center of the city. So you had this, this also uh, the, what was called a focusing effect. The blast would rocket out to the hills and then uh, come back in and kill kill even more. Uh, so it was just an ideal target. It did have a military base, but it was, you know, not, uh, you know, it was a relatively small part of the city. I think that it's estimated that maybe 10,000 soldiers were killed there in the in the bombing. Um, and then uh, Nagasaki was actually number three on the list. Also, it had not been heavily bombed. Uh, there was a city called Kakura, which was number two, but on the Nagasaki day, they found it was obscured by clouds, so they went on to Nagasaki. And in fact, Nagasaki, we used the plutonium bomb, unlike the uranium bomb at uh, uh, Hiroshima, the plutonium bomb became our weapon of choice, and in fact, if it had landed on target, would have killed as many or more than in Hiroshima. Uh, fortunately, it landed uh, somewhat off target, so only maybe 75,000 or 80,000 died, um, and um, so that was, that was basically the targeting. Was there a, an awareness of what the, the the destruction would be, not just in terms, obviously, in terms of uh, the physical destruction, but, I mean, did I imagine that the Defense Department, that uh, Truman had a document that said, we project X, Y, or Z uh, right. to happen? I mean, what, what, what do we know about what they projected? Well, we'd had the Trinity test just three weeks earlier, and uh, so we saw and filmed and uh, knew exactly uh, the incredible explosive force, also the radiation effect, although we covered it up. Uh, you know, you mentioned my book, Atomic Cover-Up, and that book, along with an earlier book I did with Robert J. Lifton, uh, really focuses on the cover-up. It focuses on what we knew and when we knew it, and then how for decades we uh, tried to keep the truth from the American people or most of the truth, and that involves the radiation effects. It involves, you know, the true effects on civilians. Uh, and, uh, you know, Atomic Cover-Up focuses more on the suppression of film footage that was shot by the U.S. military. Yeah, uh, I, I right want to talk about bomb. that in a moment. I'm just curious as to, like, when they were calculating the, uh, the w what was going to be done. I mean, because this, this yep. you know, uh, again, it's, you know, to, to talk about uh, the really indiscriminate killing of of 20 to 30,000 children and um the right. tens of thousands of, of women i mean it just non combatants um right. you know there's there's a calculation that goes in here right i mean you know the 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 thing that we're told that that separates uh um uh one uh, uh party from another in terms of whether or not they're terrorists is is the idea of like well our intent is to hit military targets uh, right, not right. to uh, to uh, kill civilians, but when right. you go into an enterprise, 
you know, just on the, the basic sort of like uh, legal theory. When you go into an enterprise knowing that uh, uh, X is going to happen, you have liability for that. And I, I'm curious as to what what our assessment was. I mean, was there a document that says we will probably end up killing 30,000 children or, yeah. you know, I mean... Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think they, they they didn't really want to focus on the children. Uh, they certainly had documents and assessed the fact that this would likely uh, wipe out the city. And knowing this is a city of 350,000, you know, you, you do the math. Uh, it, uh, I guess the point is, is that the uh, effect of the bomb was not a surprise to anyone. Um, and a, a, after the Trinity test, particularly, the atomic scientists um, really got behind a petition to ask Truman to uh, do a demonstration shot, uh, you know, off the edge of the city or someplace where the Japanese could see it, um, uh, do something to hold off using the bomb. You know, most of the atomic scientists had gotten into the project partly because they were, you know, wanted to get at Hitler. They wanted to get at Germany. Germany surrendered. They saw that Japan was on the close to surrendering, and so they lost a little bit of heart for using it and felt there were alternatives, such as a demonstration shot uh, uh, or just holding off. Uh, and, um, of course, that didn't happen. And that's because they were very, particularly after the Trinity test, they were very well aware. And, and then after the Hiroshima bombing, uh, scientists, some scientists celebrated, others, you know, there's, uh, you know, accounts of scientists throwing up, scientists, you know, uh, Oppenheimer, of course, was haunted the rest of his life. Um, and um, and then you had people like Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, who had told uh, Truman's top aides that he was against the use of the bomb. He was disgusted by the use of it. He thought it was unnecessary. Um, so there was revulsion in in some quarters, but the American press and uh, you know the uh, White House and so forth managed the story so that people didn't get the full information and um, and, and you know the impact on you know, what we had done was not fully known for many, many years. How, I mean, talk about it. Your book is uh, The Atomic Cover-Up, and, and we're, of course, linked to it on uh, Majority.fm. But how um, how concerted was it? I mean, was it a a, a matter of just, we're going to suppress a couple of uh, films? Or, I mean, how, right. what, what, was there an apparatus that was designed to basically come in and we occupied Japan for uh, half a dozen years, I guess, maybe? Um, not quite that long, but uh, for, for three close, years. Close. Yeah. To... Uh, was there, I mean, was there an agency? Was there a task force that was specifically like, right. your job is to make sure that the implications of this are muted? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The U.S. military, uh, via MacArthur's office in Tokyo, um, seized all well, all Japanese photographs uh, that the, their photographers were taking and all newsreel footage that they took, uh, seized that, um, and there were no, you know, Japanese really didn't see photos that they, they had, their people had taken or anything for, for years. Uh, that was a tight suppression. Uh, and, and the U.S., uh, when we sent reporters and photographers there, was subject to strict censorship from to Tokyo. Uh, the, you know, the, the famous story of a Wilfred Burchette, the first reporter who got there, who had to circumvent the censorship by sending something practically in code via London, where it got published. Uh, the first reporter into Nagasaki, named George Weller, a very well-known war correspondent, uh, filed dispatches from Nagasaki. They were killed by MacArthur and didn't it weren't found for 50 years. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the U.S. military sent this elite film crew to shoot at massive length uh, effects in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And... Uh, that footage was suppressed for decades and uh, only slowly came out, partly because of things I covered over 30 years ago. Uh, and so it was quite quite complete. Now, yes, people saw glimpses of it. There were photos published of, uh, you know, destroyed landscape. Um, people certainly got, got some sense of the destruction in the city, buildings and structure, uh, you know, other structures and so forth. But... You know, the full effect on people, you know, radiation hazards were, you know, were covered up, uh, you know, that was were managed. It slowly came out about this new thing called radiation disease or A-bomb disease. Um, 
but the, the true extent of it and the, the true radiation hazards. And, you know, again, looking to what was the effect of this or why does this all matter? Well, for decades, partly because of the suppression, we had all of those hundreds of nuclear tests, U.S. nuclear tests in the Pacific and in Nevada where soldiers were subjected uh, and local people were subjected to radiation clouds. Uh, the whole, when I was growing up in the 50s, I was subjected, you know, radiation drifted over the U.S. I, everyone, uh, you know, 2,000 miles away, like me, was getting a dose of radiation in milk and in other, uh, other things. Uh, and then, and of course, the nuclear power industry developed quickly because this radiation fear was, you know, was minimized. Um, so, uh, you know, there's all kinds of after effects of this 1945 uh, use of the bombs and the acceptance of the use of the bombs. Well, what, what, in Japan, what, how did that track in Japan? I mean, you know, I, I just, when, when you, you read and you see the images, and I, I watched uh, the video that um, uh, was posted on, on your site this morning, and it's, it's just, mm -hmm. it's horrific, and it's, uh, I think it's one of, uh, of several that you're going to be posting, I think, over the course of the next couple of days. But, um, uh, w w it just occurs to me, you know, how is it that you get something like uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, in a in a country that had been subjected to this horror uh, on one level? You know, what what how, how has Japan come to reckon with it? Right. Well, I, the, the and I've been quite a student of this. Uh, the Japanese. As we saw with the occupation, you know, once we made this uh, conditional surrender that they kept their um, emperor, uh, MacArthur came in, and they, you know, they're often praised for sort of accepting the inevitable. They, you know, they lost, then let's move on. And there is a lot of that in their reaction to the uh, atomic bombings. Now, on the one hand, it must be emphasized, they then drafted a new constitution which basically banned that they would ever develop nuclear weapons themselves or even allow them on their land. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. famously has got around that over years. But, you know, right in their constitution, they say, we're pacifist and we're, we'll never have nuclear weapons on our soil. So that's one part of their reaction. The other part was sort of, a, in a way, a guilty feeling that, okay, we did, you know, we started the war, we did bad things. We don't want to have that brought up continually. And, and we know they, for years, they uh, censored some of their own textbooks and things like that. Uh, this is all true. But part of that also went into, they didn't really want to talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki that much uh, because, uh, you know, it brought up a bad, you know, a bad uh, image of them from World War II. So uh, even some of the survivors uh, complain, have complained for decades that they were not treated all that well by the Japanese government because they were kind of pariahs and they sort of wanted them to go away, you know, shut up and accept it. And that's how much of the country has been. Let's not dwell because it's, you know, after all, we, we help provoke it. So, it, so it's been a very mixed reaction. Uh, but, you know, of course, the end result is they have not developed nuclear weapons. They, and in terms of Fukushima, you know, they would say, we are this tiny landlocked country. We, uh, we need to develop, you know, we had to develop nuclear weapons. We just don't have the resources to uh, do other things. So we, we have to have nuclear, uh, I mean, excuse me, nuclear power. Um, you know, we, yes, we have this Hiroshima stigma, but, you know, we really didn't have much choice. So, um, you know, I think that's the way it, that plays out. I mean, it, was there a, a, an era, and, and, and like you say, you've been writing on this for 30 years now, um, but it, was there a particular time where there felt like the United States was ever sort of um, uh, addressing this or reconciling this? Like, I don't remember as a, a kid um, ever there being anything other than, you know, Fat boy and glory. I can't. I can't remember the name yeah, of the book. Yeah, little, little boy and fat man. Yeah, exactly. And it was written for, for, for young kids yeah. uh, to no, read. Uh, I, well, I, there, there, there certainly was no reckoning, or attempt at reckoning until the 50th anniversary in 1995, and I was very uh, involved in that uh, and saw how the media played out, and I've written about it a great deal. Uh, and you know, and there were things like, you know, the U.S. media 
would cover, they talked to survivors, they would cover uh, some of what happened there. Um, and it's sort of like with Gaza, you know, they, they can point to a lot of the stories that, uh, you know, depicted what terrible things happened in Gaza and so forth. But uh, with Hiroshima, they would then ultimately end up embracing the official narrative, which was we really didn't have any choice. And, uh, you know, one of the prime examples of that was the one TV newsman who had you know, who really put out a major report, I think it was a two-hour special, that questioned the official narrative was Peter Jennings. And um, I I think that documentary may even be available on YouTube. Um, And then he took incredible heat for it, you know. uh, know, He's Canadian, you know. (laughs) He's, uh, you know, liberal. He's pro-Japanese. He's, you know, he doesn't understand, you know. So the one newsman does one TV program, and he was, you know, vilified. The other example, just very quickly, was some people may remember the Smithsonian, uh, the Air and Space Museum tried to mount an exhibit in 1995 of the uh, Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the bomb. They had about half of it put back together, and they were surrounding the plane, which could, the plane itself kind of glorifies the bombing. But they had this full-fledged exhibit around it, which looked it looked in a ba- more balanced way on the dropping of the bomb and was it necessary and it you know it was approved by numerous historians and was uh you know quite balanced well even the fact that it raised any questions about maybe we didn't have to use the bomb or maybe there was a downside caused veterans and the media uh and right-wing congressmen to freak out and the exhibit kept getting cut back and in the end it got killed the exhibit itself they showed the plane with no exhibit, no exhibit. So this is as recently as 1995, where the country really was, in many quarters, trying to come to grips with this. And the you know the major national um, you know attempt at that was completely shut down, uh, and only the you know the pro bomb narrative was allowed. Uh, and and uh, you 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 write today that um, there is. There's been at least a, a a slight change in our recognition of this, in in the sense that um, we're now sending ambassadors. Uh, right. D- d- just talk about that. Well, just n- no. Not only has no president ever ever gone there while in office, but they they never sent an envoy of any sort to the memorial services in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and. Uh, I think it was about four years ago now, Obama broke that tradition and started sending uh, the U.S. ambassador to both memorial services. And now, as I write today, Carolyn Kennedy is the U.S. ambassador. So now we've had a Kennedy today uh, in Hiroshima at the official ceremonies. Um, and a guy, I presume she's going to go on to Nagasaki. So, But when that was announced four years ago, oh, Obama took all, oh, he's pro-Japanese, or he's pro-this, or he's, you know, he's against the bombing, you know, and of course Obama rushed in and said, no, it has nothing to do with that, we just think it's time to, you know, send uh, an ambassador. But, you know, again, this is an example of something that seems perfectly, uh, you know, rational, and even a small attempt to come to terms with this is, you know, is attacked, uh, you know, in the media and in, in political circles. Well, you know, what really strikes me uh, is how the ability to sort of shape that narrative um, has, in really just in the last, I think, 10, 15 years, the nature of, of the Internet and of social media and things like YouTube, um, I mean, because even now, I mean, like you say, you know, as you, as you post the, the, that footage that was taken uh, in the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, even now it's really only available uh, to the public through YouTube. I mean, we've seen clips, I think yeah. you said, uh, in documentaries, but um, that it is really impossible to control the narrative of something. I mean, you know, to contemplate controlling the narrative of something so large and so uh, right. devastating today seems impossible. And in fact, I think that's a part of the reason, if not uh, um, the reason why we are seeing the Israelis unable to control that narrative in, in, in Gaza. 
Right. Well, I think it's, I mean, first of all, it's, it's, uh, what you're referring to this footage, people could just go to YouTube and put in atomic cover-up and they'll come right to my my video. It's just simply atomic cover-up search. Uh, but I think what you're saying is all true, but I think it's more for, um, you know, current and ongoing events. I think a historical event, I think social media is, um, you know, a little less uh, influential there. Uh, you know, most people just throw up their hands. So, well, I don't know. It's too big. It's gone on for too long. And there's so many other things to look at. So I, I understand that. I think there may be a generational change that won't may, maybe won't have a lot to do with social media. It's just uh, older folks who, um, you know, uh, were alive then or have, have fathers who, you know, have told the stories about, you know, Hiroshima saved my life. And, I, again, I don't discount those stories, but that has been the overwhelming narrative. And I think, um, you know, younger people, even as we see with Gaza and Israel, is quite a gen, quite an age gap when mm -hmm. you look at Gallup poll on what their view. So I, I think it's similar here. I think we probably see it with the death penalty, capital punishment. Uh, there's a lot of, of stubborn, um, what do you want to call it, biases or narratives that uh, are going to be, you know, changed over time, just generationally. Uh, I think <laughs> people do get tend to get a little more conservative as they get older and so forth. So we'll see. Well, I mean, but, it's not, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's different. It seems to me it's different from the, the, the death penalty in the sense that, um, there was such an emotional investment that was direct, you know, when you talk about this. And I would say the same thing, you know, I, I think it, 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 the, the situation in Israel um, is analogous in the sense that you had a generation <clears throat> that had an emotional investment, a deep, deep emotional investment uh, in the creation of the state of Israel or uh, in the ending of World War II, and they passed that emotional investment on to their children. But right. there's a the the resonance as it travels over generations begins to diminish, uh, and then there's more opportunity for exploration. Uh, you know, I mean right. that that to me seems to be the 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 the, the operative factor that we. That it would have to take 70 years, 65 years, right. until we could even send an envoy uh, to right. Hiroshima right. Exactly is amazing. Right. right. Well, yeah, and, and I think that, I mean, I think in, in, in favor of uh, changing views on the Hiroshima is simply that nuclear threat is still with us. The U.S. still has a first strike policy. I don't know if everybody knows that, but we have never repudiated our, our uh, right or our, our claim to use nuclear weapons first. Uh, we still have that. We still have uh, thousands of warheads. Um, and there's still plenty of hot spots in the world. Uh, and there's plenty of chance of accidental nuclear war. So there's a lot of reasons for people to go back and say, you know, we never really came to terms with the two times we've used them. We never really said, you know, we re when we say never again, we have to mean never again. And that doesn't mean making exceptions. And we've made exceptions for 69 years. And uh, so I think it is, it's a current issue, but uh, it, 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 sometimes it's difficult to make people think that, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are really current issues. Well, uh, Greg Mitchell, I appreciate your coming on and talking to us about it. Uh, the book is Atomic Cover-Up. Uh, you can also uh, go to YouTube and just simply... Uh, search Atomic Cover up there to get to, to some of these uh, videos, which are really just incredibly um, uh, just shocking and, and disturbing. And I appreciate your, your giving us your perspective on it today. Sure. Thank, thanks, Sam. Anytime.